Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS. Today in this session we are going to have a discussion on the newspaper of 19th April 2024. So let's begin with our first section that is about the detailed analysis and we have these four topics today that we are going to have a discussion on in detail. So one is about India's position in the South China Sea. <coughs> Second, some reforms in education for early childhood then an issue that has been led that has been seen in the baby food products by Nestle and then something related to TB. So these are the four topics that we are going to discuss in detail and then after that we have these three topics from the prelims perspective one a new cruise missile that has been successfully tested one about how WHO has defined pathogens which transmit through air and then finally the volcano eruption that we saw in Indonesia. So these are all the topics that we'll discuss today. <coughs> Sorry. So the first topic that we have is India's nuanced approach in the South China Sea. Now in what context are we discussing this? Very recently you might have seen that there was uh, an issue that cropped up between China and Philippines and this is where we saw that there were some Chinese attacks on some of the uh, Philippines vessels. So in that context we see that again South China Sea which has been in controversy for a very long time comes back in the news and in this context it is this time between Philippines and China and if you look at this map you will understand that why South China Sea is so controversial because each and every country that you see here they have a claim that also coincides with the claim on waters by some other country as well. So for example, if you see the red line that, uh, that is about China, you can see that this red line is what China claims to be theirs. And then similarly, we see that you have Malaysia also which is claiming a part of it and that's why that also you can see it is coinciding with the waters that have been claimed by China. Similarly, in case of Vietnam or uh, in case of Philippines etc also you can see that all these lines are coinciding. So that's why we see that there is a very complex interplay that we see in this South China Sea area. And this is where China being one of the players there we know that China is always known for its territorial and maritime aggression and the or the expansionism policies that China has and in that context we see that this is where the controversies have cropped up between Philippines and China. Now in this situation when we look at India's position and this is exactly what we have to understand and few of the topics that are being discussed in this particular editorial as well. That in March 2024 we saw that India's external affairs minister S. J. Shankar during a visit to Manila he had declared India's robust support for Philippines in maintaining its national sovereignty amidst the heated South China Sea dispute that happened which involved China. Now this statement it aligns with the more assertive stance from India which is compared to its previously cautious approach that was taken. And in 2023 India and the Philippines had all, uh, already urged China to respect the international rule based maritime order and the 2016 International Court of Justice ruling which had favored Philippines. Now this is something which becomes very very crucial. So we see that uh, the support that we have seen this time this is different from India's very neutral stance that has been there in the past and this time we have gone one step ahead and we have changed our approach and we have been asking China to respect the laws respect the uh, international laws and that's why specifically this is something that comes to that brings into the question the 2016 International Court of Justice order that had actually uh, supported Philippines. So, so that's why this becomes very very crucial in this context that India now has seen this support and that's why this marks a very significant policy shift for India moving away from a neutral position that uh, that basically we had been actively supporting in the international uh, maritime laws. Now in this change, this change basically reflects India's broader strategy under the Act, e Act East policy as well. 
and this is something that was uh, initiated by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi, which transited from economy fo uh, focused look east policy to now having a broader approach as an act east policy. The policy now also emphasizes strategic engagement, security cooperation and at the same time economic integration with the Southeast Asian countries and in the Indo-Pacific region as well. So that's why we see that this becomes very very crucial where we see that now we are emphasizing on strategic engagement, security cooperation and economic integration with the Indian Pacific region and the Southeast Asian countries. So that's why in this context we see that this becomes very very crucial from India's perspective that how we go uh, forward because initially it was just an economy when it comes to the look east policy we see that the look east policy largely was about the economic interests was largely about the economic interest and in this context we see have see that with act east policy we have tried to go one step further now the indian enterprises for example uh, ongc videsh they also have in, engaged in energy exploration in this particular area and they also have been underpinning the in, uh, that there is India's commitment to the freedom of navigation and resource exploitation under the UN clause in this particular uh, area. So that's why we see that <clears throat> these kind of participations from Indian companies also has been a very broad aspect of how India has been acting towards these areas. Now, at the same time, when we look at India's evolving stance, it also arises from its own complicated relationships with China as well, characterized by the border disputes that we have seen and especially the heightened tensions that we have seen following the 2020 Galwan Valley conflict that happened between India and China. And India has responded to China's assertive regional behavior by enhancing its military presence and cooperation with the South Asian or Southeast Asian nations as well. And that also underscores the commitment that India has to this region's security and also countering China's aggressive claims. So that's why furthermore, when we look at India, India has recognized the strategic importance of South China Sea also for the regional and global maritime security. So that's why in this particular scenario, what we see is that South China Sea is very pivotal for international trade and energy routes. And this recognition has led India to support the criticality of the ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific strategy. And despite the internal divisions that we have seen in ASEAN, we have seen that India has been a very strong supporter of the criticality of ASEAN. And India's firm advocacy for rule-based maritime order and its strategic engagement, it also reflects a commitment to this region's stability and upholding of the international laws in the face of all the challenges that have been posed by China. And that's why this nuanced approach, it represents India's broader foreign policy, uh, broader for, for, uh, foreign policy um, in the Indo-Pacific region, which also aims to protect its own interests while also contributing to the regional peace and the legal uh, compliance uh, in this particular area. So that's why we have to understand that how exactly there is a basic shift that we have seen in India's policy towards South China Sea. We are no more trying to be neutral in this approach because we have seen the kind of uh, territorial aggression that China has been showing every now and then. And we have been seeing all those issues whether on our northeastern borders or the northern borders. So that is where we see that India's approach or India's shift in approach also stems from. So that's why uh, this becomes very crucial to understand how exactly we see a change in India's policy. Now coming to the next article, activity based curriculum drawn up for Anganwadis. Now in this context what we basically see is that the national framework of early childhood stimulation, this is something that was introduced in 2024. Now this basically uh, is a very comprehensive guide for fostering early childhood development from birth to the age of three years for a child. Now in this particular scenario, in this particular scenario we are talking about something called as Nav Chetna. Now Nav Chetna basically is an activity based curriculum developed under the National Education Policy of 2020 and it emphasizes 
on a continuous learning process. Now the framework that was established through the collaboration of various different governmental bodies and educational institutions, uh, whether you talk about the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of Education and the different organizations, for example NCERT. We see that all these basically came together, uh, they all came together, so for example uh, Ministry of Women and Child Development, Health and Family Welfare, Education, other organizations, other organizations when we say very importantly NCRT was also involved. So there were all these who have been involved here and that's why this Nav Chetna is designed to stimulate the cognitive and sensory development through a series of planned activities and it tries to target foundational skills in early language, literacy and numeracy by engaging children in activities that involve uh, talking or playing, moving, listening to music, uh, sensory explorations with very particular focus on sight and touch. So we see that there are all these activities that are being planned as a part of this particular program. Now, so so that's why when we look at this, we have to understand that there are various different aspects that we are looking at. So for example, when it comes to it, what all are we targeting? We are targeting language. Literacy. Alright, we are tra targeting, uh, 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 then again numeracy as well. We are targeting numeracy. So all these things we are targeting and there will be different types of approaches that we will take. For example, as I told you that it could be through talking or playing or through music. So there are different approaches that we can use here. So for example, even different types of movements. So all these can be used. Uh, with very particular focus on sight and touch and this curriculum that's why underscores the critical role of the first three years in a child's life a period during which up to 75 percent of the brain development occurs so that's why it is very very crucial to understand the value of having these 36 sets of activities from 0 to 36 months uh, where we see that all these things will be taken care of and this is where as we understand that 75% of the brain development for a, a child happens. So that's why it provides a very detailed instruction for caregivers, for example, the parents, the Angarwadi staff, the ASHA workers on how to engage children in age and skill appropriate stimulation activities. Now these activities are designed to capture the child's attention, to promote uh, interaction and also to encourage independent exploration and learning among themselves. And that's where the framework also outlines all these activities. So when I say that there are a set of 36 activities which have been divided by age groups. And for instance, for example, activities including uh, simple household items uh, for sensory play like reaching for objects or uh, imitating sounds or manipulating small items, etc. So all these things will be counted as the activities. And as children grow, these activities also involve to include self-feeding or exploring their own environment, engaging in uh, uh, engaging in uh, pretend play in the kitchen, in playing with the duff and also uh, uh, let's say uh, recognizing themselves in a mirror. So there are small small activities that have been listed out and by the age of 18 months uh, the child would be encouraged to scribble with crayons as well and by 24 months they engage in sorting and matching of matching kind of exercises such as organizing shoes for example and that's why uh, by the age of three the activities become more complex which will be also maybe uh, including riding a bicycle or naming themselves identifying colors so the framework also tries to address how to identify and support children with developmental delays as well it tries to suggest the caregivers to adjust the activities to also suit their uh, children and how their developmental uh, stages are observed. So that's why overall the structured approach it basically aims to provide a solid foundation for a lifelong learning and development. 
so that's why this is basically what we are looking at from the perspective of this nav chetana which is being introduced as an activity as a part of the national education policy of 2020 where we have now tried to also understand the importance of the early childhood and education in early childhood via various different activities now let's look at the third article and this is about nestle nestle baby food sold in india has higher sugar content a recent report by a swiss ngo uh, which is called as the public eye and the international baby food action network that is ibfan these two basically these two uh, had published a report and they have brought to the light significant discrepancies in the sugar content of Nestle's baby food products which are sold across different global regions. This study which had tested approximately 150 food products in a Belgian laboratory, it highlighted that Nestle's uh, Cyrillic products uh, for six month uh, old babies contains no added sugar in the United Kingdom and Germany. In contrast, the same products had 2.7 grams of added sugar per serving in India and nearly 6 grams in Ethiopia and Thailand. So despite WHO recommendations against added sugar in food for children under 3 years old, Indian <coughs> regulations permit limited amount of sucrose and fructose in the baby food. Now in response, so that's why we have to understand that uh, this is where we are, what we have seen that WHO says that added sugar, it recommends against added sugar in food for under 3 years of age, children under 3 years of age, but Indian regulations, they allow limited amounts of sugar. Now Nestle India, in, in response to the report's finding, what we see is that they have emphasized the company's commitment to reducing the added sugar, citing that the reduction up to 30% in the last 5 years in their uh, infant cereal products have already been done. And Nestle India also stressed their compliance with both the global and the local nutritional standards, including those containing added sugar and their ongoing effort to innovate and reform their products for to try and further reduce the sugar level without compromising on nutrition. So whether about nutrition, whether about quality, safety or taste, they have said that they will take care of each and every aspect of controlling their food standards. Now in this context, when it comes to India, we have seen that the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India is reviewing the report findings. And moreover, the experts uh, in this particular scenario, what we have seen is that they actually have criticized uh, the sugar content in baby food. And they have noted that health risks such as non-communicable diseases and the development of addictive eating habits uh, and a preference for sweet tastes may start developing from an early age if these kind of food is being given to small children. And specifically, one, uh, one of the heptologists, he basically also uh, talked about the fact that he accused basically Nestle of maintaining a double standard, offering products with lower sugar content in western markets compared to the higher levels in the Asian markets despite very significant sales figure in these regions that is Asia. And this controversy that's why spotlights uh, on, on the ongoing global concern about the nutritional content of baby food and ethical considerations of food manufacturing and marketing practices, particularly in the low and the middle income countries. So that's why this is very, very important for us to understand that where these things are heading. That unfortunately they are maintaining separate set of standards for the European and the US based markets. At the same time, for the Indian markets, they are not maintaining the same standards. And even if let's say they are talking about their commitments and they are talking about the fact that they are trying to reduce the sugar content, it could not be that difficult that if you are selling the same product in Europe and the US, it could not be difficult for the same companies to uh, sell the same product with the same standards in the Asian markets as well. So that's why if there is a difference here, the difference only lies in the fact that they are getting more out of the same by having lower uh, quality products in the Asian markets. Their 
the different the the profit margins would increase by just increasing the amount of processed sugar instead of increasing the amount of the nutrition that was needed through these food articles so that's why this is a very unfortunate state and unfortunately what we have seen is that a lot of com companies specifically uh, companies who have a global presence we have seen these kind of problems before where they have maintained separate set of standards for uh, low and medium income countries and they have maintained a separate set of standards for the European and the US based uh, US kind of countries and at the same time uh, it's not only about the company as such but we here also need to understand the role of the local authorities and the governments in all these countries as well where they have allowed things like this to happen they have to probably be more stringent with the laws uh, and the regulations so that the companies maintain the same safety and nutritional standards that they maintain in the western markets let's move on to the next article randomized control trials the technique that transformed tb care now in this context what we are saying is that when it comes to tb it talks about a couple of uh, instances of tb for example kamala nehru the wife wife of jawaharlal nehru she tragically had died from tb back in 1936 and at the same time we see that uh, uh, there have been other important Uh, political figures for example mohammad ali jinnah as well he also had succumbed to the same disease some years later now these high profile deaths they also underscore the grim reality of tb which had no effective treatment despite the identification of its causative agent mycobacterium tuberculosis back in 1882 itself the narrative of tb treatment has since undergone a very significant transmission tra transformation and this has led to the 2024 the world tb day theme that we had that yes we can end tb so so that's why we see that uh, when it comes to tb modern therapeutic regimes now have made it possible to aspire to eradicate global tb or uh, tb globally by the end of this decade before antibiotics tb treatments were largely ineffective and consisted of you can say uh, palliative care such as fresh air rest in high altitude uh, sanctoriums or surgical interventions uh, like uh, lobectomy or maybe also different types of uh, aspects that we were using but at the same time the discovery of antibiotics that happened by alexander fleming it initiated a new era in tb management and but what we basically see is that there were substantial advancements which were made by austin bladford hill hill who was affected by tb himself he had made significant contribution to the medical statistics statistics and he pioneered the randomized control trial which is also called as the rct at the british medical research council now in this particular scenario when it comes to uh, his role when we look at the role that he played so he basically brought into the picture development of randomized control trials now this innovation basically led to the first rct evaluation uh, evaluating the efficacy of the antibiotics against tb which made a paradigm shift in the treatment from surgical to pharmaceutical and his work extended beyond tb he formulated something called as the bladford hill criteria which fundamentally uh, with fundamentally principles in modern uh, you can say epidemiology and also at the same time we saw that uh, there were different uh, he was also instrumental in establishing casual uh, causal link between the public health such as uh, between smoking and lung cancer and as we approach the potential eradication of tb thanks to the part that he has played the medical uh, community also has acknowledged the profound impact of his research to which continues to be an inspiration for the entire medical science so that's why we see that this important just when it comes to the importance of randomized controlled trials this became very very crucial in uh, 
having clinical trials for TB and for understanding TB and the eradication where now we are moving towards whether worldwide targets that we have or the Indian targets which have been set for 2025. So we have to understand these things and especially in the context of where it stems from. Now coming to the next article and this is about indigenously built cruise missile successfully tested. Now what we have seen basically is that DRDO had conducted a successful flight test of long range subsonic indigenously developed cruise missile and this was again done from Chandipur. Now this is something what we see is that this is a basic test that has been done by DRDO where we are looking at a missile which will travel a cruise missile that will travel at subsonic speed and usually when it comes to the cruise missile we understand that cruise missiles are often slower in their uh, speed so that's why we are saying subsonic subsonic means less than the speed of sound so generally speaking what we see is that there are two types of missiles you either have a cruise missile or you have a ballistic missile now in this case what we see is that ballistic missiles are largely faster they are generally you will see that they can be supersonic or hypersonic in nature whereas when it comes to the cruise missiles they are generally they are generally subsonic apart from you can say one very very important example being Brahmos where the Brahmos missiles are although they are cruise missiles but they are supersonic in nature supersonic or hypersonic in nature so 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 Brahmos is the only one you can say which is an exception here but largely it will be a uh, cruise miss cruise missiles will be subsonic in nature now the details of this missile and what exactly this missile exa uh, is all these details have not been given yet and uh, the missile although it is said to have looked very similar to the nirbhay subsonic cruise missiles but overall the details of this missile have not been given yet then another article that we have on page number 16 and this is who defines pathogens that transmit through air now pathogens that transmit through air they basically now will be defined by the term infectious respiratory particles or IRPs and this is what WHO has defined. So WHO basically has ended the lack of a common terminology to describe the transmission of all these pathogens particularly what we saw during the COVID-19 pathogen. So that's why this is something that will help that to standardize the various different names or various different jargons that are used to define these kind of pathogens. So now these pathogens will be called as infectious respiratory particles. So just one line about this that you need to know. Then moving on to the next article, Indonesia evacuates thousands after volcano erupts raises tsunami threat. Now what we have seen is that these pictures were published last evening and these pictures come from Indonesia. So Indonesia rescuers were actively involved in an emergency response on Thursday. After we, what we saw was in Mount Ruang, in Mount Ruang, all right, in Mount, Mount Ruang, we saw that a volcano erupted almost five times that led to the evacuation of thousands due to significant volcanic activity. Now this eruption, it caused near, uh, nearby airports also to close and triggered warnings about potential dangers of failing, uh, of falling debris or also including the risk of tsunami. The volcano located on a remote island, it had basically initially erupted four times on Wednesday and produced, produced a lot of ash over uh, almost up to a mile high. And this prompted authorities to uh, uh, escalate the alert level to the maximum in their 4 tier system that they have. Now this, uh, this entire scene became very dramatic and we saw that the nearby islands also experienced uh, considerable damage with a lot of, we see that uh, homes were punctured by falling volcanic rocks. 
so these islands roads were also covered in volcanic ash and we saw that uh, a lot of uh, complication in the evacuation efforts also happened because of all this so until now thankfully no fatalities or injuries have been reported and the situation was precarious uh, which prompted evacuation of almost 11,000 residents from these islands so uh, where you have a total population of approximately 20,000 so the ongoing volcanic activity it has also raised the potential tsunami risk which also talks about the fact that when it comes to Indonesia's geographical location uh, it is seismically active area which is called as Pacific Ring of Fire so one thing that we should know is about what exactly do we mean by Pacific Ring of Fire now this Pacific Ring of Fire is a major area in the basin of the Pacific Ocean where a large number of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions keep on occurring from time to time and as you can see this is an area which has been marked here this is the area which is called as the Pacific Ring of Fire so now this follows the edges of the Pacific Ocean and the length approximately becomes approximately 40,000 kilometers and that's why we have to understand that when it comes to this Pacific Ring of Fire first it touches the coast of the North and the South America on one side and the eastern coast of Asia and Australia on the other side so including islands like Philippines, Japan, uh, Indonesia, New Zealand etc. Now the tectonic plates when we look at this this region is characterized by active plate tectonics and uh, several of the tectonic plates including the Pacific plate, the Philippines sea plate all these or Indo Indian Australian plate all these are basically interacting along the Pacific Ring of Fire and that's why the Ring of Fire contains approximately 75% of world's active and dormant volcanoes altogether and this is also due to the fact that, that the, when it comes to the subjunction zone which are the prevalent which are prevalent all along this particular ring where one tectonic plate moves under another and into let's say you can say the mantle which also leads to a lot of volcanic activities now this is also a zone uh, of frequent earthquakes as well because of the movements of these tectonic plates the ring of fire has been look uh, has been the location for most of the world's earthquake including some of the most devastating earthquakes that we have seen in this particular area including for example the 2011 earthquake of the pacific coast in japan so overall what we have seen is that the countries which live along the ring of fire they are also prone to frequent natural hazards such as volcano eruptions or earthquakes etc which can also lead to significant socio-economic impact and pose challenges to disaster preparedness and management as well so that's why something about ring on, of fire in this context becomes crucial now lastly coming to the main questions for the day the first question discuss the strategic important implications of India's evolving policy in the South China Sea analyze how this shift aligns with India's act east policy and its broader goals in the Indo-Pacific region so there are two things that we have to discuss first about what is happening and you can mention the context in which we are talking about and then how India's position is shifting that until now we had neutral stance but now to, uh, we are seeing that we have started putting some pressure and speaking against China in all these aspects and how it aligns with India's act east policy how the transition that we have seen in India from look east to act east why all these things are a part of that something that we discussed while discussing the article second is evaluate the effectiveness of the national framework of early childhood simulation 2024 in addressing the cognitive and sensory development needs of child from birth to three years something that we discussed and all those activities etc discuss how the implementation of this framework across various socio-economic contexts in India might face challenges and suggest the measures to overcome them so the first part of this question is what we have discussed in the in that article the second part of the question is where you have to think of what are the challenges where do we lack what are the things to be done so for example how can we ensure that it reaches each and every child it reaches each and every region of the country and not only the 
<coughs> more developed area but also the lesser developed areas and also the far off rural areas as well and what are the challenges that one might face in uh, reaching out to the last mile children so these are the things that you have to discuss in this particular question so with this we come to the end of today's discussion thank you very much for being here